just an absolute pleasure to see all you folks here today and some folks here who hopefully are joining us on Facebook Live. My name is Jeff Kreidoff. I'm the police chief for the city of Springboro, and we're the sponsoring of this panel discussion. So without taking too much time, I did want to take some time to introduce the, the people that we have here who have agreed to take some of their time on a Wednesday night uh, to share some stories with us. On the far right is Randy Piegler. He's a member of the Springboro Police Division. He was hired as a full-time police officer in 2000 after a period of time as a reserve officer for the city of Franklin, Ohio. During his tenure with the police department, Randy has worked in the detective division and is a hostage negotiator for the regional special operations team. He is also currently our juvenile officer, vehicle inspection officer. He is a mobile camera instructor and evidence technician. You also see him patrolling as one of our bike patrol officers. Randy received the highest award from the Warren County Prosecutor's Office for his investigation into a serious child assault case, which years later became a murder prosecution. One of the very few in the history of the city of Springboro. Born and raised in the Troutwood area, Randy was drawn to the profession by Officer Moses Prez and Gary Engel from the Dayton Police Department. They allowed Randy as a young man to play with their emergency lights or siren, their public address speaker and spotlight, and it was the kindness of those officers that initiated his desire to be a police officer, which probably explains why he sits in our parking lot playing with his lights and siren out today. <laughs> so uh, next to him is Antoine Scott, officer, a member of the Springboro Police Division. He joined the division in 2011 after working for several years as a corrections officer for the city of Middletown. Uh, during his tenure with the police division, Officer Scott has also worked as a detective for three years with the Greater Warren County Drug Task Force, where he distinguished himself in several very high-profile drug investigations. He is a member of the Warren County Tactical Team and best known lately for being Officer Blue's big brother, and you'll see Officer Blue in the audience here since Officer Blue lives with Officer Scott in the evenings most of the time. So. Officer Scott was born and raised in the Dayton area and graduated from Wayne High School. His interest in law enforcement came from his older brother, Ryan, who is the next person I get to introduce. Ryan Morgan, Officer Scott's older brother, is a 14-year veteran of the Middletown Police Department. During his career, he was assigned to the Police Special Operations Team for 10 years and a member of the Department Honor Guard for 10 years. During his time with the police division, he was a canine handler for five years, field training officer for 10 years, technician on the Butler County Swiftwater Rescue Team for five years, currently a detective assigned to general investigations such as homicides and other felony cases. He holds several instructor certificates in less lethal weapons tactics, hostage negotiation and rescue, and active shooter rapid response. Born and raised in the Dayton area and a graduate of the Dunbar High School, Detective Morgan became a police officer to make a difference and try to change the perspective of police officers in his community. Next we have Officer Crystal Rankins, and I have to take some responsibility for her name being uh, misapplied, uh, shown incorrectly stated in some of the promotional material as Crystal Hall. She actually had a name of Crystal Hart at one time when she worked for the Spring Road Division of Police. I want to acknowledge my responsibility in, in that error. Officer Rankins is a member of the Miami Township Montgomery County Police Division. She has been with them since 2014 and in police work since 2008. She did distinguish herself as a member of the Springboro Police Division, but apparently the draw working in the area of the Dayton Mall was just too great. So she went up there, and we do, we do miss her in the Springboro Police Division. Officer Rankins has training certificates as a field training officer, an evidence technician, bike officer, and is a member of the department's crisis intervention team. She's made a significant mark in her work as a school resource officer for the police division. And because I, the day I met her, Officer Rankin has expressed her desire to be a person of influence and a role model for youth. Officer Rankins was in her teens when the calling came to be a police officer. She'd watch officers in her neighborhood growing up with curiosity and intrigue as they handled calls for service. She admired what they did for people in need and the lack of fear they showed when handling a tense situation. And finally, I could go on for quite a while about our last officer, Captain Maurice Robinson from the Cincinnati Police Division came to this profession a little later than most police officers. After a career working in communications and customer service for both IBM and AT&T, Robinson was teaching a course in the Cincinnati Police Department when he made a decision to join the department. 
He rose quickly through the ranks from police officer to sergeant to lieutenant and then to captain. And in recent years, he's been in charge of the criminal investigation section with the responsibility for the homicide unit, personal crimes unit, financial crimes unit, fugitive apprehension unit, as well as crime lab criminalists. A graduate of Holmes High School in Covington, Kentucky, he holds a bachelor's degree from Northern Kentucky University, master's degree from the University of Cincinnati, is a certified law enforcement executive through the Ohio Association of Police Chiefs, graduate of the Senior Management Institute for Police, and is a member of the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives. Should be noted that tomorrow will be his last day with the city of Cincinnati, as he is the new chief of police for the city of Racine, Wisconsin. Gonna be a cheesehead. <laughs> His wife, Donna, who is also with us, is a 30-year veteran of the Cincinnati Police Department and currently serves as a lieutenant. And finally, I would like to introduce uh, our panel facilitator, Pastor Bruce Moxley, Jr. Has a fan club. He is a Springboro resident and well-known within the Dayton area for his pastoral leadership. He currently leads Dominion Ministries International in Clayton, Ohio. I'm personally humbled that he has agreed to moderate this discussion tonight. So without any further ado, Pastor Moxley, the floor is yours. Thank you. You guys can have a seat. You can tell I have, uh, have some paid people right up front. I, I would like to just take a moment just to acknowledge and introduce my wife who's here, Mashonda Moxley, and two of my four daughters. We're, we are 17-year residents here in Springboro. Our first, our first three uh, have uh, graduated from Springboro High School or in college and are in college. And then our youngest is a junior at Springboro High School. So we've been here for, for a little while anyway. So it's good, good to have you all. Well, uh, I had an opportunity, I believe, three of the five that are, that are up here uh, to just talk with them. And I want to be very, very uh, transparent in the fact that um, for me personally, uh, the, the talk that I had with them was really, really encouraging. It was educational, informational. Um, it really caused me to think about some things based upon my perspective of of uh, law enforcement. Uh, I come from uh, West Dayton, that's where I grew up and, and graduated from Dunbar High School. I went to the University of Dayton as well. And uh, I just have some, had, had uh, some perceptions about law enforcement and uh, they really helped me to, to begin to at least look at things differently. So I, I would like to start off uh, just by asking for those that are, are interested, I know that the, uh, the bios uh, that we read uh, shared a little bit uh, pertaining to this question. But the first question is, why law enforcement as an African American? I got here uh, by way of a very circuitous route. Um, as uh, Chief Cardoff said before, at the time that I entered into policing, I was actually a, uh, a sales rep for AT&T, before that with, with IBM. And I was working at Cincinnati State Technical and Community College doing a teaching class customer service systems. And I was asked to help develop and uh, deliver training to the Cincinnati Police Department. And we entitled this thing Tactical Communications. And it was designed to allow officers to identify their own communication styles, very quickly assess the communication styles of the people they were talking to, so that there would be a better level of communication in a non-arrest situation to cut down on citizen complaints. Well, in about, I think, 2001, we had a, um, a critical incident where a young man was killed that was unarmed. And that resulted in four days, four or five days of civil unrest. And I am the father of three African-American sons, and I was concerned about the quality of policing that was being delivered to people that looked like me and my sons. And I decided that I could either complain about it or I could try to be the change that I wanted to see. And that's how I made the decision to become a police recruit at the tender age of 49. Anyone else? Well, for me, it was kind of a little different. What initially drew me to it was actually um, my siblings. Uh, I grew up in the house uh, with eight children, single mom. Uh, I'm the eldest uh, boy. I have one older uh, sister. Uh, we grew up on uh, west side of Dayton as well in some of the uh, projects, as you would say. And 
you know, for me, it was it was kind of weird. I, I always felt like I was being kind of a big brother protector of my siblings, and I felt like, you know, for every uh, drug dealer I arrest, every murderer, every rapist, every um, burglar or whatever, in some way I was protecting my siblings. That's kind of what drew me to it initially, and uh, once I started doing it, um, I started real realizing that, you know, police officers really can make a difference in the community if they really want to. Uh, so here I am. And you're a graduate of Dunbar High School, right? Yes, sir, oh, okay. 2003. Right. So we'll point that out. <laughs> um, since you mentioned siblings, originally I wanted to be a Marine. Um, my father was in the Marine Corps, um, and I just loved everything about Marines. However, he was very old school, and was like women don't belong in the Marine Corps, so you have to listen to your father. Um, however, growing up, I did have an older brother who was unruly, an unruly juvenile, so there were days where we had five police officers at our house, two in the front, two in the back, each, you know, sometimes one on each side, and I never understood, you know, why for my brother who is just, what, 15 years old, and, and, I, and, and he, he would try to run, and they would slam him, and I just, you know, that's your family, so you're like, why are they slamming him? Why are they doing this? Um, I, I was raised in Huber Heights, so we were probably one out of four black families back then. Um, so just knowing that, um, I, I also, I'm the baby in the family, however, I'm very protective. Um, so just the, the drive of wanting to get out in the community, um, I thought that I could do a better job when it came to coming across someone else of color. Um, not because of just my skin color, but just my upbringing itself. You know, I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth, so I felt that I could understand what people are going through, um, which, without going through my history of law enforcement, it kind of found I had to go from different places just to find my home. I couldn't be in one area where they were more privileged because I didn't understand what privilege meant. Um, that's why Miami Township was kind of perfect for me because you had those who, were, let's say, privileged, and then you had those that didn't have money, and I didn't have money. So when I came across those people that didn't have money, it was never a judgment. It was, I understand, I knew how to talk to them, um, I didn't judge them in any way. Um, so basically, I think that's what it was, just my upbringing, how they treated my brother. I wanted to um, be a part of that and make a change, and hopefully, you know, community members would um, slowly start trusting police officers. Yeah, and also to echo what Officer Morgan said, um, I'm child number five of eight children. <laughs> um, growing up, we didn't have the best conditions. Um, so as a, as a child, I always had a fantasy to become a cop, you know, playing cops and robbers. Um, I've always had the interest of being a cop. Um, so once Ryan became a cop in Middletown, I realized that dream was attainable, um, and I went for it. You know, thanks to Ch Chief Kratoff, he gave me a chance, an opportunity to come work for the Spring Grove. I've been here for 10 years. I uh, never look back. I enjoy it. Antoine, do you mind sharing, uh, you shared a story when we were talking regarding uh, when you were younger. I think you and your brother had gotten pulled over. Uh, was, I believe it was, was that you, Antoine? It was me. Okay. Um, it wasn't Ryan. It was me and I have a younger sibling, a brother as well, uh, once west side of Dayton. Um, he was driving the vehicle. We were stopped by a two-man unit in Dayton, uh, two white officers. Um, one officer was dealing with my younger brother, and one was dealing with me. Um, and I found myself in a situation, the cop I was dealing with was very polite. You know, he treated me like a, a human. And the other officer was calling my brother dumbass, um, excuse me, language. <laughs> um, it just very rude and treating him less of a human being. Um, so seeing the two different perspectives of law enforcement, you know, growing up, so man, I want to be like the cop that treated people of color with respect and dignity. So, thank you. You know, one thing that brought me into law enforcement was, uh, like I said before, is the two officers that came through my neighborhood on the east side of Dayton. Uh, one was Hispanic, one was white. And all it took for me was to play with their license sirens and don't judge me, but I was hooked. <laughs> I, was, I was all in. I was all in. That was the highlight of my life. Uh, those officers was cool. Officer Perez, I think the other officer was Tavis. Um, but they just like talked to us about general stuff, like nothing, you know, this, this common stuff. You know, we were like 18 years old back then. And from that point, you know, I got myself a little, uh, a kit, 
with the handcuffs, a little cap gun, a little baton, and a little plastic badge. I used to practice with my mom. You know, I got to practice. She was willing to, and I like put the little plastic cuffs on her, or whatever. But you know, get a little bit, be- little get, get a little bit deeper than that. You know, my dad, um, he suffered from um, uh, PTSD as well because he was in the military back then. Um, I remember where he had all those hostages before in the house. Dayton showed up, and they coached him out. They coached you know us out one by one. You know, I remember us coming out through a window because he had everything barricaded. Maybe that's why subconsciously I want to become a hostage negotiator without knowing what was I was seeing to what I'm doing today. It's funny how things come full circle. Um, I know people, when cops come into view of people, I know it's not at their best time at times. And we're supposed to be that cooler to make things right if we can. Make things better. Make them show it's another way out. But for me, um, I love what I do. I love the city I work for. And I got nothing but love for them. And Randy, you from you grew up uh, in the Trotwood area, correct? That's correct. OK, all right. Um, in what ways, and this is something that, uh, again, was uh, very, very just enlightening to me uh, that kept, and this topic kept coming up when I was meeting with them regarding uh, educating the community where law enforcement is concerned. So the next question is, in what ways do you see educating communities regarding law enforcement beneficial? I'm sorry, I just thought about a question that I got at one time during the interview. Why do people commit crimes? So this is a lot easier. Um, I am a member of NOBA, which is the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives. And during the annual conferences, one of the uh, educational pieces that we got was a, a program called the Law in Your Community. And it's a certification process. And what it does is it teaches us how to teach young people in school settings what, they, what their rights and responsibilities are when they encounter law enforcement officers. So being able to deliver that and answer questions and answer hard questions, but to also try to encourage young people to be the change that you want to see is one of those many ways that we can go about educating young people who, are, who can be a little bit more hot-headed than we are. And one of the main things that we try to encourage them to do is stay quiet, stay respect, respectful, and live to complain. Because the, the most instructive thing that you can do to change a system is complain on that officer and make it official rather than trying to do something in the street. And that's more effective. Um, I think it's important um, for us to educate the community. Um, for an example, I think citizens Police Academy for a department to have that is very important. Before I became a police officer, I went through a Citizens Police Academy. Um, and like I told you in the story in reference to my brother, and there was five police officers that showed up at my house. At that time, at, at the age that I was, I'm like, that's ridiculous. Why does it take five officers for one guy? Um, while I was at the Citizens Police Academy in Huber Heights, um, I decided to be an um, example. I was about a buck ten when we did this um, test, but they had me on the ground and they said, fight for your freedom. You have a cop that's on you. You don't want to be arrested, resist arrest. So I did, and it literally took, and there was adults that was in there. Again, I was probably like 21. It took six adults to get my hands behind my back. Um, I think it's important that people come through, citizens come through and see some of the things that we go through because it's easy to sit back and listen to media and, and agree with what they say. But if you guys are actually in our position and you go through Citizens Police Academy and you see why it takes five people to, or five officers to arrest a subject or why when we have to make a split second decision how much adrenaline is going through because at the same time it's going through our head, am I making the right decision? Um, it's a second that you have to make this decision. So I figured that if citizens are in this program and they see everything that we go through, put you guys through different steps, uh, different things we handle on the streets, 
then you guys have a better general idea of what we deal with. And I think if you're educated and then you see what happens in the media, then you're also gonna understand that the media is only gonna show you five seconds of what they wanna show you. More happened prior to that happening. Um, but also you're gonna say, oh yeah, I remember I'm in the Citizens Police Academy, the reason why they did X, Y, and Z is because of safety protocol, to keep the community safe, to keep the officers safe. So education is powerful in every aspect of everything that we do in our lives. And, and this is one thing that, especially with everything going on, I think it's important. Just to piggyback off what uh, Officer Ring said, so much right now uh, is the way the, the public responds to things so much is determined by what the media puts out. It seems to be that whatever the original story that goes out is kind of what everyone latches on to, and uh, everything that comes out after that is, you know, it's second, it's, it's second to whatever you saw. They don't really pay it any attention. It's, uh, people tend to get set on this is what happened, and this is what I'm going to believe what happened, and they want to see what they, you know, what the media put out there, whether it's a social media post or um, some, there are some news um, channels that are kind of uh, irresponsible in what they put out, and it can lead to uh, misconceptions and enrage people and cause much more of a, a divide and uh, just anger towards uh, police officers. Uh, so I think, like she said, getting people out there uh, are coming into the Citizens Police Academy almost, you can always find one close by. Or just, you know, I know for our department we have kind of an open door policy where if you want to make an appointment with our chief or one of our administrators or our supervisors to come in and talk about a situation, they're more than willing to do so. Uh, they'll show you uh, recordings of whatever's on the, uh, the cameras from the cruisers or uh, radio traffic or t I've even been called in to speak on you know, myself where I've had incidents where community leaders have come in uh, with someone that I dealt with uh, and asked the chief could they speak to me about what happened to kind of hear from my perspective what led up to uh, my actions and that kind of set things aside or, or kind of calmed things down and let people on once they understood why I did what I did a lot of times from the outside looking in, you don't under, you don't understand, so you're out there dealing with it yourself. Uh, my perception of a situation is going to be different from Officer Scott or from Officer Rankin or the Captain or Randy. You know, every, we all perceive things differently. We all uh, work in different environments. Uh, we deal with different things. The things we deal with in Middletown, Springboro probably don't deal with a lot. Uh, <laughs> and so, you know, it. But that experience that I go with. Or, or that I deal with or that I've had um, in my career will make me respond to a situation differently than they will. So that's where being able to explain that to people and get that education uh, might go a long way in bridging that gap between the police departments and the community. Anyone else? You know, just to piggyback what all these authors said, um, Education is very important. Um, I had a situation where I was in the, I was on Facebook Live during the incident, where the public saw one thing, and that wasn't the case at all. And once our video of my camera was released, um, it kind of painted a bigger picture for everyone. And I remember uh, the chief uh, had like this uh, uh, coffee with the sh with, with the cop, if you will which means you can come in, have a cup of coffee with a, call, a police officer. I think that's a great idea to start the dialogue. That's an opportunity for the community to come in and stop and talk to us you know, about issues or about questions or anything like that. We're more than willing to answer that and to give our perspective of what this may mean so they can better understand the situation at, at hand. That's all I got. Okay, all right. Um, for those of you who serve in a predominantly white community, as black police officers, what challenges have you had, if any, in, in, in the community that you're serving as a black officer? I got the microphone, Ralph. Okay, I got the microphone. Well, um, I started back in 2000 here at Springboro. Um, it was interesting. I was doing radar on Clifford Franklin Road, uh, 
looking for speeders. I got called in as a person pointing a rifle at Patsy Motorists. Another incident where I was, saw a kid out playing basketball. I was at work. I decided to stop and play basketball with him. He got called inside. About 10 minutes later, I got called into the office. And I got said, well, were you at this place and, and did you step out and at this address and so on and so forth? Yeah, that was me. Well, they was called to make sure you was really a police officer. I'm in uniform. I'm in a white cruiser with Springboro, biggest day on the side, Springboro police with the triangle. I was confused. I really was. Um, but that didn't bother me. That didn't stop me from you know, pushing forward and serving the community I love. Anyone else like to address that question? I can only say I only had maybe one incident. Um, there is a certain section in Miami Township where they uh, don't really like people of color. Um, and it, the thing was is that this person was being derogatory toward me, but I was busy doing my work, and the only way I knew about it is because my officer stuck up for me. Um, they blankly said, you know, um, she bleeds blue, and you are going to respect her. Um, when I heard that, I kind of turned around like, what, did somebody say something? And they were in the process of arresting him. Um, so it, to have it directly to me, I've never really experienced that. Um, so yeah, in, in reference to you know, those type of neighborhoods, I've never really had any issues. Um, I'm gonna be honest, and, and I hope that I don't upset anyone, but the only time I've actually had an issue in reference to my race was when I was working downtown Dayton. I was a Sinclair police officer. And unfortunately, I had more issues with blacks because I was in uniform. Um, it, I think that they just see the uniform and they just don't like you because of your uniform. Um, but I've, I've received more flack um, than I have with other races, unfortunately. And I think it's just the badge that I wear. That, that was, that, that's kind of a, that's actually a segue into my next question. As, as black police officers, what challenges have you had uh, with those in your own community, with, with those that you're dealing with that are black? Now I can take that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the challenges being an African American and being a police officer, there are segments of the population that think that, uh, that those are co conflicting interests, rather than valuing you for being willing to, to step into this line of work and protect those people, people in the, in the neighborhoods that, are, that, uh, that other folks might look down on. So I've been called Uncle Tom and asked why I didn't look the other way, and, and my answer is very simple. The, I'm here because somebody in this neighborhood called about your behavior. So I'm protecting those people that are not coming out that need to be protected from you. And that was my answer. Anyone, I think we have another person. I was just really just piggybacking on what they said. We, I feel like I've gotten it worse from uh, the black community more so than uh, the white people that I've dealt with most of the time. They feel like I'm a sellout or Uncle Tom. I've seen arrests when, uh, you know, they say, I mean, why are you doing this? You're supposed to be black. And I'm like, I mean, it don't wash off. I am. It's just, I, I, I'm just out here doing my job, and that's all I want to do. Uh, but as uh, the, the captain said a few times, uh, you know, be the change you want to see. Uh, you know, I'm out here because I, I want to change uh, the perspective of law enforcement, and, and I know that there is a call for change in our uh, profession, but if you really want to see change, I mean, more of us have to get out and do it. And there just seems to be a very uh, uh, big disinterest in it from our community. I know for some, my sergeants back there, he goes around all over Ohio uh, actively trying to recruit uh, black applicants, and it's it's very very difficult for him to, to find anybody that has an interest to be here. 
Uh, but like I said, if, if, if we really want to affect change in uh, policing and make this more diverse, we, we need more of us to come out and actually want to do it. Antoine, did you want to? Yeah. Okay. Uh, for me, I'm going to tell a story. Um, keep it short. Um, but the recent Black Lives Matter movement, the protests last summer uh, with the George Floyd killing. Um, my situation was I was assigned to go work somebody's protest as a bike patrol officer. Um, and I found it funny that I was being criticized um, rather than some of my white coworkers for being a black officer on the line working. You know, I found it funny as one white female, I mean, she's this close to my face yelling at me, you should be ashamed of yourself. Black lives matter. You know, and I'm looking at her like, lady, I know black lives matter, that's why I'm here. You know, so I found that pretty interesting that a white woman telling me a black male you know, that how black lives matter I should be ashamed, I should quit my job, you know, choose a new profession. Um, you know, so, so that's some of the things we deal with, not just from black people, but white people too. Um, like I shouldn't feel ashamed for coming out to make a difference. So. Um, just to touch on that real quick, but I think that the opportunity that we have, and I don't really know Captain very well, but um, sometimes when that happens, when we have someone else who's black that criticizes us, hopefully that the situation that we're in is not, um, you know, what's agitated like when Antoine was saying he was doing the Black Lives Matter. Um, but there has been plenty of times that I've been able to talk with them. Um, it seems like sometimes when they're hot headed, because I've had several of them that my officers are around and I am the only black female at Miami Township. And I'll show up at a call and I, I'll see that they're dealing with the black male subject and he's giving a hard time and he's you know throwing down the race card and I'll kind of pop in and I can tell that they're not listening to what my <coughs> officer's saying um, that gives me the opportunity to kind of step in there and to say no just listen you know I think that as long as they're not past 10 on their aggression scale we have the opportunity and that's why we need more black officers um, have the opportunity to step in there when it's needed to try to calm the situation down because that's the problem. Um, I do police and youth camp, um, which a lot of, we get it from all the suburbs around the area where we have a lot of kids from nine to I think 15 that comes to camp for us for the week. Um, and my main thing that I tell them is that when you come across an officer and they tell you to do something, just comply and do it. A lot of them are raised that they don't have to give us their name. They don't have to listen to us, and that causes problems. So as an officer now, when I'm approaching someone who is 16 or 21 and they have that mentality that don't, they don't have to listen to me, a lot of times I'll take that chance and step in and give them that ear-to-ear -ear talk like, listen, this is what you need to do. Um, and it's worked in my favor. I've been an officer for a long time, and it's worked in my favor most of the time to take a situation from it going from disastrous to calm them down and then explain to them, because a lot of them, no matter what color you are as a police officer, they think we're ruining the world, we're ruining their world, when really they ruin their own world. So then I have the opportunity to let them know that you're in this position because you put yourself in this position, and I have a job to do. Now, because you have a warrant, you're going to jail, but just think about this. Now that you've taken time to take care of your warrant, you, you don't have to look behind your back anymore. Um, but I, I just think it's important to have more black officers or more Asian officers or Hispanic officers so that when we have situations like that, then maybe by them seeing some of the same race or color and the situation is heated, they would stop and, and listen to us and we can calm the situation down a lot more. Now, I, I know this, this question will be a very, it's, it's a huge question, uh, uh, a very broad question. But, uh, you know, when I, again, when I sat down with them, um, yeah, again, being transparent, you know, where I come from, a lot of the mindset that they're talking about is, is that mindset. I just don't trust cops, um, don't, don't trust uh, black cops, and definitely don't trust white cops. And that's how I grew up. Uh, and, and part of that had to do with experiences that I experienced. Another part of it is just, that's just the culture of where I grew up. Um, with that being said, uh, what, what would you guys say could be done to bridge the gap 
Uh, we talked about having more black officers. What do you think could be done to bridge the gap between law enforcement and the black community? Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you snuck that one in on me. Law enforcement cannot make this change by itself. Our communities, our schools, our churches, our mentors, our social organizations have to make sure that we are articulating to our young people what society expects, what, what good behavior is, what your responsibilities are as, as a citizen. Everybody here has gotten at least one call that in any other time would have involved either policing or being a psychologist or a sociologist. We get called for everything. And we get a lot of training, but our societies have defunded different areas of, of social services and psychological services and um, drug addiction, alcohol addiction, homelessness. And police get called to handle those things that we are not as well prepared for as other segments of society need to help fix the problem. We are not, not the end all and be all to all of society's problems, but 911 is an easy response for every problem. The rest of us have to pick up that mantle and run to help us so we don't have to do everything. We don't want to do everything. We want to be guardians first. We don't want to be warriors. So, but all of us in this society, in this free society, have to be a warrior for those that can't take care of themselves, a guardian for those that can't take care of themselves. We all have that responsibility. Anyone else want to? Answer he that? pretty much hit every corner. Uh, we can't do it on our own. And just being a school resource officer, I don't know where we dropped the ball in our society, but there's so many kids. Um, I'm with the middle school and elementary that have no respect for authority not for their teachers, not for their own parents, not for their police officers, nothing. Um, and that right there is, is hard for us also because if they can't even respect their parents, you know they're not gonna respect a police officer. Um, so like he says, you know, we can't raise everyone's kids. We can't, um, we don't have the tools or education to handle someone who has that extreme mental health issue. Um, it's easier to sit back on your couch and say, oh, they should have done this and should have done that, but you don't know what it's like to be confronted and to know that person has mental health issues, but right now they're aggressive and they got a knife. Um, we we got to make a split decision on what we are trained. I'm a CIT, um, part of the CIT tra training, and they teach us, okay, you know, if someone says that there's a purple elephant in the room, acknowledge there's a purple elephant in the room. We try that, but it doesn't always work. Um, and, our, and our main objective half the time is just to get them into the hospital, put a 72-hour hold on them until the, the doctors can figure it out what they can do. Um, and that sometimes doesn't work because we end up seeing them back on the street three hours later. So um, again, it's a community thing. We all have to work together, raising the kids, showing them respect, um, re respect to one another also. It's, it's not just you know the children respecting elders, but everyone respecting each other. Um, we're human just like anybody else. We just wear the badge. Um, yes, we did choose this job with everything going on, and I still put my uniform every day knowing what's going on outside, and I love what I do. Um, but we can't fix everything, so we need everyone in the community to get together and help us out. Well, one thing we can do is kind of what we're doing right now, uh, more communication, more open dialogue uh, between uh, the police and the community, especially the black community. Uh, but I think that sometimes communities come to come to the table with a cool head or at least an open mind to be willing to sit and listen. Uh, sometimes, as I said earlier, uh, people tend to get a certain thought process in their head, and, that, and that's it. You're not changing that. You're not, not going to derail what they what they think happened or what should have happened. Uh, but I think just if we can just talk, man, just have better conversations and dialogue. Uh, and then, yes, it starts at home, too, sometimes. Like you said, we were, a lot of us are raised in an environment to have a just inherent distrust for the police. Um, obviously, we everybody here knows this country's history uh, with the black community and the police. And I think that... Uh, that's been passed down in our household. So it's always that uh, concern uh, 
for our for our children. So we pass that down to to us, and that's we view police officers just with this uh, this distrust and sometimes downright hatred. You know, I it's times I'll pull somebody over, and I have all intention just to say, hey, you got a headlight out. You probably don't even know you have a headlight out, but I'm just letting you know you got a headlight out. But before I can say anything, I'm already met with uh, verbal aggression where they're cussing, you know, what what the, you pull me over for. And um, now my my level has kind of raised a little bit now because now I'm like, well, does he want to, does he want to hurt me just for me pulling him over? Because, you know, it's, it's we just got to do better with uh, just talking and uh, raising our kids to just, you know, like he said, just comply now and complain later. Just like they all said, um, the dialogue has to continue. Uh, dialogue and, and patience. It's, and also accountability, taking self-accountability. There's so many times we stop people and their first reaction was, oh, you're stopping me because I'm black. You know, half the time we don't know the race of the violator of a vehicle because you drive by at such a high rate of speed or tenant windows, whatever the case may be. But the first response is always, oh, you stopped me because I'm black. You know, it's like, no, you ran a red light, you almost hit two pedestrians in a crosswalk, you know? So, so self-accountability uh, and also just the dialogue. It has to continue outside of here. Um, I challenge you guys, if you guys are from Springboro, if you see a Springboro cop out working, stop us, talk to us. And we're more than willing to stop and have a productive dialogue with anyone at any point in time as long as we're not on a call and that conversation interferes with such call. Um, but continue to talk to us. I mean, we're human. Like I said, I grew up in Dayton. I love basketball, love Ohio State. We can talk about whatever um, at any point in time. Just to piggyback on what everyone up here said about that over communication. I remember crossing one gentleman uh, back in the day on North Main Street in our city, uh, Mr. Perry, and he did not like the police at all. Um, he was angry towards the police, I guess the contact we had with him and his family. But when that's that one day when I stopped to talk to him um, on the side of the road, he was cussing me out, of course, but I was like, why are you so angry, man? What, what, what's going on? So when I started that dialogue and started talking to him, um, he started to calm down and start telling me how he really felt about the police. And this is like, you know, early 2000s. So after we, you know, talked a little bit and we kind of got through some patches or whatever, I kind of explained some things and just that communication dialogue between them on the side of a road, cars going by and everything. They had probably had no idea what we were talking about, but we were talking about some real stuff But he was dealing with. They had no idea about. So as we got, we was able to push through that stuff. We became almost friends, if you will, where I even brought the guy out to church and everything. And just that communication part, the turbulence we had to get through first because his understanding of the police. And once we got through all that, it was all good. So that kind of echoes what everybody up here is saying is about the dialogue and communication, how important it is. It may be a little turbulence in the beginning, but if you're able to push through that and keep going, you can make ways. This, this question is kind of a long question, uh, but I wanted to pose it to you as law enforcement. Uh, in some communities, there is a belief that there is a code in law enforcement called the blue wall of silence. This term is used to denote an informal code of silence amongst police officers not to report on a colleague's errors, misconducts, or crimes, including police brutality. Please share your thoughts on this belief that is prevalent in some communities. I accept that. Um, I think the first time that I ever heard the, the term blue wall of silence was probably when I was watching a TV show that was in the 60s. I made a conscious decision to take promotion exams to become a supervisor because I recognized as I was going along that one of the ways that you are able to change the kind of services that are being delivered is managing the people that deliver the service. 
So to that end, as a supervisor, your responsibilities are to respond to reports of use, uses of force, to review, now that we have them available, uh, in-car video, review, review body-worn camera um, footage, and determine whether or not, through the written reports and the, uh, the video evidence that you have and the witness statements, whether or not the officer's actions are consistent with department policy, procedure, and training. And I have told people that I've helped to prepare for promotion exams that one of the first things you have to be prepared to do is tell someone that you may like, tell another adult when they've made a mistake. It is incumbent upon you as a supervisor to correct that mistake so that person doesn't think they've been doing it the right way. One of the rocks in my shoe was I've been doing this a long time. Yeah, but there have been people doing a job a long time the wrong way. So it, it takes that additional courage to correct that behavior, show them the right way, provide them with the training, and provide them with an opportunity to, pr to prove that they can change that behavior, that that officer can change that behavior. And I live by a simple motto that I would ask people or, or state to them, you should provide the kind of police services that someone that you would like someone you love to receive. It's that simple. I don't say treat people the way they want to be treated because I don't know how you want to be treated. But if you treat someone the way you would want someone you love to be treated, that then becomes a lot more equitable. Um, I never heard of it being called the wall of silence. I know the thin blue line. Um, and I think, and, and you guys can tell me if I'm wrong or not, but that the thin blue line is generally just the idea that us as officers know what each other is going through. Like I said before, we we go through a lot. The time we put on our badge and we walk out into the community and we deal with our day, whether it's eight, 10, 12 hour shift, we deal with a lot. Um, and it's one of those things that only police officers will get it. Um, you know, there's times where people would, you know, we would go out to a fatal crash. Um, and I know a lot of media is looking for us to have some kind of response in our face. Um, sadly, a lot of us just put that horrific scene in the back of our minds and, and try to forget about it. Um, but each other, as brothers and sisters of the blue line, we understand that. It can cause mental health issues in police officers, so we understand that. Um, and then that, that black line that goes through that, that's the officers that we've lost. The, the, those who've also came and put their uniform in, on every day um, and, and we call it fought the battle that we do every day. It's never been really, I've never heard of it being the wall of silence. Um, I know at Miami Township, we've all got to the point where we look out for each other. We're all human. We, some of us marry, some of us not. We go through the same thing like anybody else does. Um, so I don't know what my partner that day or another coworker has gone through that day, but if we go to a call and say we have a disorderly subject and I notice that my um, fellow officer is getting a little bit more aggressive. We simply just come back and say, I'll handle it. Go ahead and go in the back. Um, again, it's one of those things where we keep an eye on each other. If we know someone's just not having a good day and, oh, yeah, he's getting a little bit rowdy with this um, subject, I'm going to go ahead and tap him out and I'm going to take control of this whole situation. So um, I've heard of the thin blue line. That's what it means to me, and I think it means the same to other people. It's not really a code of silence. Um, I do know that all of us have fought. I know I fought to get to where I'm at. I'm not going to let another officer's um, decision destroy what I've accomplished in my time as being a police officer. So if I do see something wrong, you best bet I'm going to say something about it to the, the chain of command. I'm not going to turn around and not say anything. And again, that goes back to any incident. If I see an officer harm somebody and I don't say anything, you really think that's not going to bother me? Like I'm not going to be able to sleep at night knowing that I was there and I could have made a difference? So no, that's not going to happen. I'm here, I wear a badge for a reason. So you best believe if one of my brothers or sisters is doing something wrong and it's in my presence, I'm going to tap them out. And that's just how we do it um, for the most part. I can't say that all of them do, but for the most part, that's our main goal. Um, but yeah, that thin blue line that we go based upon is just basically what we do uh, mentally. And that's how we support each other mentally. I will touch on that just a little bit. We, we are human, cops are human. I think sometimes society forgets that. Um, so we do have a bad day. Uh, and we do have to, it's sometimes hard to transition from, you know, I might have just left a call with a deceased two-year-old and then the next call is the two neighbors arguing over 
their leaves going into their yard, you know, and I have to navigate that that emotional roller coaster. And you know, if if I'm having a bad day or I'm having a situation where I'm losing my cool, then yeah, you do have officers that you expect to look out for. Like, hey, I'll go ahead and take care of this for you. Go take a walk, go outside or whatever. Um, that's how we have to kind of take uh, take care of each other in, in that regard. Now, as far as the that wall of silence that you speak of, I, I've, I haven't seen it. Uh, do I, is there, was there a time that maybe something like that maybe existed? I believe that, yeah, I'm sure it was. But this is 2021, and I know that I police in the manner that you know, you're always on camera, always. Um, even when you don't see one, you're, you're, you're most likely going to be on camera. I, it's funny, but a few months or earlier this year, I had a situation where we were in a pursuit, and I went, ran after a guy. We called him, I handcuffed him, and I went to walk away. We don't wear, we don't have body cameras in uh, Middletown. We have them on our cruisers, but you know, I had no, no, nothing to suggest that there were that that was on camera. I mean, nothing happened that I had to worry about. But I'm just saying that there was. Uh, I didn't think there was any on camera. Then an hour later, three different videos from three different angles were posted of this incident. Um, so that just kind of drove home that point that you know you you have to police it. You're you're most likely on camera. So. If somebody does something that's going to put, uh, like she said, my job or uh, their job in jeopardy or my livelihood at stake uh, or my freedom, uh, I'm not going to risk that. Um, so I, if there was a wall, I think that wall has come down or is definitely coming down. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> speaking uh, in regards to the mental strain of being a police officer. Um, would you share with us, you know, how, how is it that as officers, how do you handle that day to day? What do you do to, um, I don't know, kind of come down so that the next time, you know, you, you're not having a bad day that's built up from day after day after day? I think that everybody kind of has to find it, what works for them. I know for, for me, it's my babies. I got two kids at home and, you know, um, you know, when I come when I come to work, my mindset is I want to get home to my wife and kids. That's all I'm thinking about when I get out there, and I want to do everything I can to make sure that my coworkers go home to their family. Um, but when I have a rough day, uh, when I do, and you know, obviously see some kind of horrific things in in our career, uh, but for me, the way that I cope is I just I have to go home and hug my kids. It's, it, for me, it's, it's, it's that simple, um, but some, some do struggle a little bit more. Uh, we, have a good, we have good administration and supervisors at our, at our department that they kind of keep an eye on that, too. If they see that an officer is dealt with uh, a lot of uh, high-stress situations kind of back-to-back, -back, you know, they'll kind of either try to put them in a different area, they'll give them a break, uh, they'll send them to... Uh, counseling, uh, we have resources available to help us cope, but I think that when you're dealing with a entire uh, culture of alpha males, uh, that, that females, <laughs> it's sometimes uh, we don't want, we find it hard to, to ask for help sometimes too. I uh, think that we are in this trying to take care of everybody else's problem and we see it as a sign of weakness if we can't handle it on our own. Um, so I think it's important that we have a support system, whether it be family, friends, other officers, somebody that you can talk to uh, just to, you know, decompress. Two more questions for you, for you all. Um, we're at 7.53. The first question uh, is regarding basically kind of the state of our union right now, the United States. Um, you know, uh, law enforcement, and, and again, on one side of the media, celebrated on another side of the media, um, terms such as policing the police is needed and uh, defund the police and things like that. Uh, what, what are your thoughts, uh, kind of looking at the, the negative side, what are your thoughts about what you see on television 
what you hear on television, if you in fact do, regarding you know policemen that that may have been proven to have mis uh, to have uh, conducted themselves in a in a wrong way. Um, as a police officer, how does that how does that make you feel? I mean, for me, you know, when when I hear about a officer involved shooting. Um, I'm just like any of you guys, you know, I'm sitting back and I'm telling myself, let's wait, let's hear the whole story before we get upset because you know, it's a police officer. I'm a police officer, so you don't wanna just completely jump to conclusions. I wanna know exactly what happened. Um, unfortunately, there are some stories where the officer may have possibly been at fault and you just kinda of sit back and wonder like, man, you know, you kinda of put yourself in that scenario like what would have I done if I was in that situation? Um, and then there's some that you're like, yeah, well, you know, he shouldn't have had a badge because um, it speaks volumes. It's, unfortunately, this world is categorized in so many different categories. And with us, we're black and we're officers, so we're kind of caught in the middle. Um, but we do, we, you know, we want to make sure that anyone who's wearing this badge is doing their job properly um, and, and, they're, and they're honoring their badge. Um, when they say defund the police, I, I completely disagree, only to the point where we do need training. Um, we need more thorough training in reference to maybe higher, um, what's, what's I'm trying to say, uh, more adrenaline rush type of training. So it's like a shoot, don't shoot type of scenario. Um, but we, we do need a lot more training, and I'm not saying that we don't. I think sometimes um, maybe the department didn't give proper training. Uh, maybe the person just... I don't know. I, I, there's so many maybes to why a situation could have went wrong. Um, but we, you know, I sit back and I think the same thing too. I'm, I'm there with you guys in, rest, in reference to the Chauvin case. I'm like, I'll let him be guilty. And you know, that was just wrong. Um, but I, I'm not judgmental because I am in that workforce. So, um, yeah, I think I lost where I was Thank going. You. Thank you. Anyone else want to? And some of us are supervisors and, and command officers. So, our responsibility now, because we perceive our jobs as being guardians, means also guarding the profession and the institution. And that is making sure that our organizations are engaging in the best practice that are, practices that are possible. The President's Report on 21st Century Policing provides us with a very solid guideline on the things that police departments can do to retain their role as guardians of society and it makes us accountable. It makes us transparent. It makes sure that there is procedural justice for the officers and for, for citizens as well. And that if we are putting together systems and processes and um, different looks at how we are performing our job, and we make those available to the public so we can provide you with as much information as possible that says, Here's what we train, here's what we teach, here is our core values, here's our motto, this is what we stand for. And then we as supervisors have to make sure that when someone does not uphold that, that they become accountable. And it has to be visible, it has to be certain, and it has to be relatively swift. The person that is perceived has broken, to have broken the trust has to work the hardest to restore that trust. I accept that. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, our, our, okay, my last question then, I, I would like for all of you to answer this. Um, what, uh, what takeaway, I not, not only want to ask it that way, if there was one thought that you could leave us with regarding your profession tonight, what would that one thought be? If you want to share with those watching on Facebook Live and those that are here, one thought regarding your profession. This is an honorable profession filled with people that are imperfect. Human beings are not perfect. We practice, we try, and if our hearts are in the right place, then the right, right, right results should come about. And we have to be our own brother's keeper and make each other accountable. That, I think, is probably the most effective thing that we can do. Thank you. Um, and just to add what he was saying, um, I truly believe this job is a calling. Um, I know earlier you were saying, you know, you know, one of the things that how we cope with this job, it's something that's just in our brains. Um, you know, when you guys 
lose someone and we have to tell you you guys lost someone, we tear up sometimes too. I don't have to know you all your life to feel the pain that you're going through. Um, when we go to these calls and we're trying to make things right, we feel it too, just like he was saying, you know, a two-year-old passes away and then he goes to the next call and people are arguing over leads. Um, we have to somehow um, get our brains together to handle every situation. Um, I generally think the police officers are in this job because they love people. They love what we do because we do save people. Unfortunately, we do take people to jail, so we're not the uh, most favorable profession that anyone can find. However, we all want to seek justice for our victims. Um, we enjoy when it's successful, when we find justice for that victim and they can live their life knowing that the person that had committed a crime against them is now in jail because we did our job thoroughly. We think about everything that we do. We quarterback every call that we go to to make sure that, okay, if I get this call again, we're going to do it the next time. So you have to understand, we don't just wear the badge and think that we're above everyone. We wear the badge. We have our scared moments, too. There's calls that we get that we know that it's going to go south, that this is going to be my last time. Did I tell my family I loved them? You know, all of that stuff, because now I'm going to go ahead and put my life on the line for this family because they need me. Um, I don't know how many people is going to do that, but you have to understand that we pick this job because we generally do care about the people that we serve. You know, I'm a school resource officer, and every time I'm at home, I'm like, oh, yeah, my kids are out of school today, and my kids... My blood kids are like, no, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in school. I'm like, no, 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 not you. You know, so now I have 2,000 kids that I want to know about all the time. And they come in, they tell me everything, and I can't fix everything. And I wear a heavy heart, um, and I wish I could fix everything. And every single one of us are told by our command staff that you can't save everyone. And deep down, we wish we can save everyone, but we can't. So please understand that, that we come and put this uniform on every day because we're here to serve you and do the best that we can. And sometimes that doesn't work out in our favor, but we do the best that we can. And like he says, we're human. So unfortunately, mistakes are made. Thank you. I would just say that it's understand the police are, are not your enemy. Especially, I say that to the black community. They're, we're just not. Uh, Especially if you look around now at the police officers that are that are working and are still here, most of them, the vast majority of them, are here for the right reasons because uh, you kind of have to be to still want to police in the climate that we're in right now. Um, you know, no matter what, you know, you cuss us, hate us, some people wish us dead, but we're still showing up. We're still going to be there when you need us. Uh, just understand that uh, we're doing the best we can with uh, the hands that we're dealt. Uh, just we're not the enemy. Morgan took the words right out of my mouth. Um, just to let you guys know we do care. I care. I can speak for every cop up here. We all care. Uh, that's why we're here tonight. Um, opening ourselves up to you guys to have this dialogue. Uh, we're not your enemies. Uh, again, at any point in time, if you guys want to talk to us, stop us. Uh, we make mistakes. We're not perfect. Um, but we are here in this profession to make a difference. And we're going to continue to be here uh, to continue the dialogue, to continue to do what we do, what we love, to make a difference. You know, when the people say the word police, it's like a scary thing these days, but it's really not. Because that frightened person, when they're in trouble, they will still call us. No matter what you are, your race, gender, whatever, you're still going to call us if you need us. And we're going to be there. Just know that if one person makes a mistake, it should not affect the whole body. That's not fair. Because we're serving a community we love. We serve the community we respect, and we put our lives on the line every single day for people we don't even know at all. So all I'm saying is that police officers are here for protection. And again, you cannot take one situation and paint the whole body. That's unfair. We care. We respect you guys. Much love for you guys. If you call us, we're going to be there, no matter what. That's what we're here for. I want to, first of all, I just want to say thank you uh, for, for your service. 
uh, day to day. Uh, would you all give them a round of applause, please? Um, you know, again, and, and we'll, uh, we're going to open it up for maybe about 15 minutes for any questions that we may have uh, from you all. Um, I shared this with those that I was able to sit down with prior to, well, we had a, a, a short meeting to just kind of get to know each other. And um, I'm 50 years old. I had a, a way of thinking about law enforcement for 50 years. Uh, when I sat down with them, uh, and I meant this sincerely, it wasn't just blowing smoke, uh, I really had a change of mind about some things. One thing that, that I believe uh, now that I see that was a great takeaway is that these people are human. Uh, I was going to start off with, with, with a question trying to be funny, but I decided not to. Uh, are you humans or are you a robot? Because the truth of the matter is, is that um, you know, you just, I just never thought about the human side of law enforcement. I just saw the badge. Just, and, and so speaking from, from my personal viewpoint, uh, talking to them just really changed my way of thinking regarding law enforcement. And then the second takeaway, which was huge, and Randy said it, was that I will, I will not put everyone into one bucket because one person did something. Uh, even as a pastor, I know that, but I didn't think about that as a uh, as as a law enforcement uh, as a police officer. You know, pastors do things, and I don't want you to think I'm a bad pastor because someone else did something. So, these are things. These are takeaways that we're hoping that uh, communities will get, and our community will get through having this panel discussion. Uh, so, at this time, you know, if there are any questions at all uh, for for any of our Panelists, uh, please stand and just go ahead and ask your question. Sure. The question was uh, the use of force and what training, or deadly force to be more specific, the use of deadly force and what training uh, they may have had regarding that. Use of deadly force is, um, each situation is different. Um, the one in Columbus, I know I, I, people speak about a lot with the 16-year-old female that got shot with a knife. Um, we are here to protect life. Um, in that situation there, um, I'm not sure what else that officer could have done to prevent that. It's very tragic, but at the same time, we're here to save lives and protect everyone. It's very unfortunate what happened in that situation, but in each situation is different, and you have to a millisecond sometimes to make a right decision in which that person make the decision, you know, they gonna be looked at for that decision they made. And hopefully, thank God, you know, it's the right decision they made. Randy, is there, is there specific training for um, those types of situations or ongoing training uh, amongst your uh, department? Yes, yeah, so there is training for, um, you know, got the fire range we go to as well, uh, along with training throughout the year. But again, when you're in that situation right there, that's what you rely on is your training. And again, each case is different from one to another. And I'm sure the people up here probably have a, you know, more to say about that, but you know, each situation is pretty much different. 
just to elaborate what Officer Piegler is stating, um, each of our experiences and training is different. Uh, for instance, Officer Morgan's been on the SWAT team for 14 years, or, uh, 10 years. Um, so he trained, he, has, he receives more training monthly than the average Road Patrol officer. I've been on the SWAT team for seven years. We train every other week in Warren County. In addition to my training um, here at Springboro, we have the Warren County Combined Training Group. Uh, every year, uh, just about every agency in Warren County comes together, and there's uh, real life scenario based training that we go through, uh, which includes uh, foot pursuits, uh, firearm training. Uh, vehicle pursuits. Uh, so we've trained endlessly uh, here in Springboro, at least. I can't speak for Middletown and Miami Township, uh, but there's countless of hours of training that we receive uh, each each year. That pretty much like every de every department is going to be different. Uh, training budgets are different. Uh, resources are different for everybody. Um, but every department does have some level of uh, daily force training. I know for us, we do a lot of uh, stress-induced type things to try to, as best you can, simulate these uh, situations that these officers are put in. Uh, they tend to pull real-life incidents and try to do training to, around those incidents. Um, all these daily force uh, situations that happen across the country, they're, they're very tragic no matter what this, the situation, what led up to it. A loss of life is always going to be tragic. Um, and we tend to, the, the one thing that comes out of it is usually there is some type of training that comes out of it where you can take the situation and try to put officers as, as close as you can into those, um, in that environment and teach them what would be a better course of action if, you know, if we feel like there's another way to do things. Uh, a lot of times it's hard to mimic that level of stress, but we do the best we can, whether it be, you know, you may have to run or uh, do push-ups or something just to get your heart rate up and then have to respond to a threat. Um, just like I said, to try to get your the mindset. So that's, if that answers your question about the training that we go through. Anyone else? Question, yes, sir. I'd be curious as to your views on body cameras. Um, are you, do they help, do they hurt, do they get in the way? When do you release the body cam images? There seems to be all over a lot of, I think, you look at the departments up there, I think only Cincinnati has the body cam. Any other departments have body cam? Am I right about that? What's your opinion on that? Actually, might be a better one for you since you. Um, oh, sorry about that. Uh, the question is: Is what are, what are our views on body cameras and and their uh, their help and their efficacy? From my perspective, and what we've trained our officers to do to know is that by utilizing the body camera, it allows us as supervisors to review officers' actions in all kinds of circumstances as they are evolving and going on. So we can develop and and, and do training to respond to that. We can applaud correct behavior and we can correct behavior that was less than, than optimal. Different agencies and different uh, political bodies have different perspectives on when to release body camera footage. That's gonna be up to the prosecutor in some cases. If, if it's a sheriff's department, it may be up to a judge. But in those instances, what we tell our officers is this allows the public, once this becomes known, to see what happened from the time you got there and it started as opposed to a small snippet from a different angle that somebody else didn't see everything that you saw. And as I said before, I believe it's an excellent training tool. And I think in some cases, it makes an officer think about their behavior as they're going about it because you become accustomed to knowing that your perspective is can be seen in the future and it's, it's memorialized. So to that end, I think it's very, very helpful. We have time for one more question. I believe there's a gentleman in the, you don't, no longer? Yep, yep. Mm. Assuming that presidential behavior still exists, does the story we've all heard of the white officer following the respectable black person sit around the community and he's in charge of his crack and they can't get into any trouble and don't get in there. Assuming that happens, and just say it doesn't for the present, how do you move your presence as an officer affects that kind of behavior? How 
how does the question is how does how does their uh, presence affect uh, any prejudicial behavior from another officer uh, if that is the case? The question, and this is where body cameras can come in. One of the things an agency can do not on, when using that body camera footage is have supervisors do a random audit of body camera footage across a number of release first, second, third relief and respond to what they see in those instances. So if there's a case like that and a supervisor sees that, you can immediately begin to take corrective action with that employee when you see aberrant behavior. Absent that, if we are present and we're gonna correct that and say, you need to knock that off, and oh, by the way, I'm gonna report this so this gets written up. And that's where the courage, ha the, intest the individual courage has to come in to tell an individual that you were wrong I'm not going to be a party to it, and it is going to be reported. You need to be fixed because you're broken. And just to add to it, if, if a scenario were, of like a scenario like that were to occur, I highly doubt that officer is going to um, have that action towards a black person. If I'm with a white officer and he's aiming in for a black community member, um, I don't think he's, those actions are going to happen in front of me. Um, so that's when the body cameras come into effect, because that's only going to happen when there's not another person of color um, present, honestly. That's how I believe. I don't think that's going to happen unless one of us is there. Anyone else? Okay. All right. Well, I, I think that's it. Um, oh, yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. I am also very, very proud of each and every one of these folks up here tonight, and I think you can see why. They represent a great profession, as was mentioned, and I can't, I, I, I didn't get emotional, but I am just ecstatic with what you've done for this community. I appreciate that, particularly Maurice moving tomorrow. I appreciate you uh, kind of pitch hitting at the last minute. On behalf of the City of Springboro and the Division of Police, I want to thank you for being here tonight. I want to thank the members of the faith community who are here tonight. We have quite a number because prejudice and bias is a sin, and that's only through the churches, I think, can be an important part of resolving these kinds of issues in our community. So I want to thank the, the uh, fathers for being here and the representatives from, from the other faith communities and Terry from, from your church. So have a wonderful evening. Thank you. I'm sure these folks will hang around if you have some additional questions, and God bless you all.